Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us to continue in these studies together, feasting on your word. I also thank you, Lord, for all of the many trials and circumstances that you bring into our lives to help us grow in grace and knowledge of you. I thank you, dear Lord, that we stand before you without spot and without blemish, unblameable, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in your sight, that we're able to rest in you and to know the peace, the stillness, the tranquility of our position in you. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we're going to continue on in our study in the book of Revelation. I believe that we're going to be looking at chapter 15 in this video. We're still in a deep freeze here in southeastern Oklahoma. So uh, the Lord has provided uh, plenty of time to study. Folks, I've never considered myself that great of a Bible teacher. I my passion really is more preaching than teaching and you know so many Christians don't really understand that there is a difference between teaching and preaching uh, I find myself the, at my most comfortable in my most comfortable com comfortable zone whenever I'm preaching not teaching although uh, I sincerely love this book uh, I sincerely love studying his word and I try to teach these scriptures uh, the best I can. And as as always, I don't ask anyone to agree with me on my conclusions. Uh, we're looking at a very uh, prophetic book. And we've seen a lot as we've traveled th over, through the chapters here in, in this book of Revelation. And we finally come to a chapter that, and, and I want to remind you that in the original manuscripts, there were no chapter divisions. Uh, it appears to me that chapter 15 and 16, uh, and in it, it also appears this way to many others, that, that they're usually taken together, uh, 15 and 16. I'll take us as far as I can in chapter 15 uh, in this video. Um, I'll probably cross over into chapter 16, though. So we finished the... 14th chapter with a reaping and a gathering of overripe grapes that were destined uh, to to the to the wine press of the wrath of God that's you know a harvesting which I believe describes both the Lord himself reaping his own the elect and the other being the gathering of the non-elect to judgment at the end of the tribulation period which, which coincides with what we read in the Gospels, where our Lord stated in Matthew 24, where, where he talked about the, the two uh, would be in the field, one should be taken and the other left. Uh, those taken there are taken for judgment. Those, because we're in the, the day of the Lord here. We're at the, uh, at the end of the tribulation period, basically. Uh, those those are taken for judgment. Those left that aren't taken enter into the kingdom. That is not a passage describing the rapture of the church as it's it's so often looked at. As uh, many Christians, I believe that they look at that as as a rapture passage. It's not. These are tribulation saints. Uh, there will be a separation of the wheat and tare, the sheep and the goats, the angels. Uh, I can't imagine how horrifying it, that's going to be for those who don't know him at that time to be gathered up by holy angels. Uh, or that that separation uh, occurs and to be left. Uh, blessed are those who are left. Of course, that's not the case with the rapture. We. You know, we can't say that about the rapture. We, we want to be taken. And, if, of course, if we are in Christ, we will be. 
There's no question about that. It's not based on human merit. So this is not a passage describing the rapture of the church. So that's the reaping. The, the overripe grapes, which are gathered, uh, being the tear of Matthew chapter 13. The tear that go into judgment. We have the testimony of our Lord himself in Matthew chapter 13, that, the, that at the end of the age, there will be a harvest of those who are the elect and, and of those who are the tear. There'll be a harvest of those, uh, uh, the, the tear, it's more of a gathering. It's not even as really as much of a harvest. The word, it's interesting that in, the, in our present context, what we've seen is the two different words. It's uh, a harvesting uh, in relation to the elect and a gathering in relation to the non-elect. The tear will be cast in the fire and burned, and the elect will be taken into the kingdom. Then I saw another sign in heaven. Okay? This, this one is in heaven. We have a uh, clear testimony that it's in heaven. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Marvelous. Don't don't let the word marvelous escape your attention. Great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues. So how could that be marvelous? For in them is filled up the wrath of God. How can that be marvelous? Well, the, the truth, folks, is that we've been anticipating this for some time. Because we were told in the sounding of the seventh trumpet, God's wrath against this system will be carried out. It'll be completed. And now we're going to see in very rapid review the pouring out of these bowls or, or vials uh, of his wrath. That fills up his wrath. That completes his judgment against unrighteousness and sin. This is where we've come in our study. So it's little wonder that this is a great and marvelous sign. This is a wonderful truth which saints and holy angels have been looking for in, in both the Old and the New Testament. We have many, many, many a prayer and a cry for God to bring judgment. But what we're looking at, and I, I want to, I want you to make sure, I want to make sure that you understand the distinction here. What we're looking at is not vengeance. We're looking at justice. Okay, God does not bring revenge. If you, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The word is justice. Okay. The word revenge occurs in your King James Version, but it's not the way that, the, that we use the word revenge, or that we typically uh, use that word. God is not taking revenge. It is God's justice. God is just. He's just. And He is, in His justice, judging sin. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass. It isn't a sea of glass. It's as it were a sea of glass. All right. This is this is where, where we know that we can take this, this. This is not literal. Okay. The message here is clear. As it were a sea of glass. So, so we're looking for something figurative to describe this. That's what it looked like to John. Having been mixed, mingled with fire, and fire usually speaks of judgment. Now, uh, I'd like to say I don't know what this sea of glass is, and well, perhaps I, I don't know what this sea of glass is. I think I know what this sea of glass is. I'm going to tell you what I think this sea of glass is. It may not be what you think uh, the sea of glass is, and that's fine. That's okay. Uh There are many who believe that this is that it's a picture of the Word of God, where the redemption and the shedding of blood is is no longer necessary. 
Uh, it's no longer a, a pure water of washing in the Word, but, but, but that's now all done and taken care of. So it becomes glass rather than water. A sea of glass rather than a sea of water. You know, John sees something that looks like a, a sea of glass that's been mixed with fire. That's what it looked like. Now, I'll tell you the feeling that, that I get, and I almost hate using that word, feeling. Uh, but the feeling that I get based on my understanding of Scripture from reading this, as it were, a sea of glass. That is, uh, I have a hard time reading that or looking at that as, as anything other than a stillness. You know, when I was in the Navy, uh, we went through, you know, on board ship, we went through some rough seas, and then there were times where the ocean was as still as, as glass. Uh, it was pretty peaceful at that time. It wasn't turbulent. It wasn't stormy. Uh, so there's, a, there's an inner stillness, folks, and tranquility, uh, and peace, okay? My peace I give unto you, he said. We can rest in him during times of difficulty, trouble, trials, storms, turbulent periods of our lives where that we can rest fully in, in him, in full dependence upon God. It, it's almost as natural as breathing, I believe, sometimes because we, it's a peace that he gives. It's not a peace that the world gives. And we know that. Many of you know that. Many of you know the peace, the stillness, the tranquility of just resting in full dependence upon God during times of, of trouble and trial and circumstances. And when we don't, it's turbulent. Our lives are, 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 can be turned upside down. Uh, that's how I'm looking at this. It's... it's it's a stillness on the part of God's people in the midst of this fire. Okay? This extremely, extremely, tur and make no mistake about it, our present context is, is, is the worst part just about of the tribulation period. That, that it's, it's, at the, it's at the end of the, the second half. It's going to be very severe. This extremely turbulent period of wrath. And judgment on the wicked. Uh, the sea of glass, transparency, reflection. Perhaps these 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 saints are reflecting God's glory, having the harps, the songs of God. They are there because they got victory over the beast and his mark and the number of his name. They were victorious, not because. Uh, they were victorious in their own strength. We are more than conquerors, folks. Today, you and I are more than conquerors. We, it is because we are in Christ. He always causes us to triumph. How could that be? Because we're not trusting in ourselves, but we're trusting in Him. They are there because they got victory over the beast and his mark and the number of his name. Their victory being based on their standing before the God of all grace. Their victory wasn't attained by what they did, by what they said, by what, uh, you know, how... Uh, it's, it's almost... Uh, I've read so many commentaries, folks, where they're, they're called heroes of the faith. And I, you know... Perhaps many of you don't have a problem with that with that phrase. I, I tend to, to to cringe a little bit at that. Heroes, okay. You know, I'm a hero, okay. But my brother over here, he didn't do so well, so he's not a hero. But I'm a hero. I I would argue we all are heroes. We we're, but we're only heroes of the faith in the sense that that we stand uh, upon the faithfulness of God. Folks, not our own ability, not our own strength, not our own faith. So their victory was not attained by what they did. 
is what I'm going to tell you, but by what Christ did. And that's the only thing, folks, that will bring that that sea of glass into your life that you can or that you can stand upon that sea of glass though it, it is mixed with fire, trouble, trial, hardship, circumstance. Now that's how I'm looking at that. It's also worth uh, pointing out that they, they had victory whether they lived or whether they died. We know that there are those. We know that there, there, there will be those who survive this period of judgment and enter alive into the kingdom. This cannot be describing the removal of all the tribulation period saints, all, the, all, the, all of the elect during that period. Can't be describing that or the death of all God's elect. Not all will die. Those who don't die will live through these bowls of judgment that we're about to see. They'll live through that. Uh, we'll see as we look at these seven bowls poured out that they're universal. They cover the land. They cover the sea. And if there are any of God's elect still alive, they're going to suffer horribly in the pouring out of those judgments. But I'm, but those, these, these ones who may suffer horribly stand before God without spot, without, without blame, okay? They've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Like in the plagues that were uh, that were poured out on Egypt, some of these bowls are similar to those plagues. They were absolutely literal then, and I believe that they're literal here. On the other hand, there were judgments that did not fall, or plagues that did not fall on the children of Israel in Egypt. They fell only on the Egyptians. For example, uh, a a uh, a darkness so great that it couldn't be penetrated. You know, you light a candle, you can't see the candle. That's how desperately intense that that dark was. And it didn't fall on the Israelites. Yet it could be that God has an elect in the tribulation period who are not yet reaped, who are not yet taken home, who have not yet died for their testimony. And these bowls of wrath would also affect them. Uh, however you want to take that, I, I I can't answer that for you. I believe that, that what we see in verse 2 is just what it says. These are those. These are those who have gotten victory over the beast, and they were persecuted for their testimony for Christ. So I come to the conclusion that the pouring out of these bowls also has an effect on God's children. And there are some that live through this. And uh, because they live through it, they... They enter alive into the kingdom. Now, I, I say that based on, on Matthew chapter 13. Uh, in verse 3, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and, the, and, and, and the song of the Lamb. And the song of the Lamb. Two songs. Now, almost universally, this is considered to be one song. Uh, song of Moses, Song of the Lamb, same thing, same song. Uh, I, I can't reach any other conclusion but that it's two songs. Two songs, one of Moses and one of the Lamb. <coughs> Look at Deut Deuteronomy. Uh, if you turn to Deuteronomy, the chapter 31, look, take a look at the last verse. Deuteronomy 31, last verse. Verse 22, Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it uh, the children of Israel, taught it to the children of Israel. The last verse of 31, uh, and Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. If you go over to the next chapter, chapter 32 if you if you're if you're looking at a king james version chapter in chapter 32 the heading ought to read song of moses so i, I clearly have a reference to the song of moses 
Moses wrote it. He gave it to Joshua. And chapter 32 goes through the history of Israel from the time God, God called them as his own, took them into the land, drove them out of the land, and, and the, the psalm or song ends in verse 43. It ends in, in verse 43. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge, hear me, hear this, he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render ven vengeance, that is justice, to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. And that's the end of the song. And that's exactly where we are in Revelation 14. That's just where we're at. Or Revelation 14, Revelation 15. That's exactly where we're at. And that song of Moses describes Israel's entire history. It's amazing. So... You know, it'd be a good song for these people to sing. I think that's the song or the psalm or psalm or song, however you want to take it, of Moses. And I think there's a separate one. There's a separate one, the psalm of the Lamb. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, look at the text, saying, quote, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest, unquote. So now I've had the privilege, I believe, to read the Song of Moses, which ends with God avenging his people, and we're, and we're looking at that right now. And now I've had the privilege of understanding what the Song of the Lamb is. The greatness, the glory, the power of our Lord and all the nations are going to come worship before Christ. That's not just Israel. That's all the nations. For thy judgments are made manifest. Uh, verse 5, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the, testi of the testimony in heaven was opened. We're now in the holiest of holies. Uh, I, I'll pause here for just a moment to tell you that I've always believed that in our present age of grace this present dispensation being that we are all members of that one body the temple which is christ that any time i have any any time you let me you allow me to minister to you you have allowed me the privilege to enter into the most holy of holy places in your life and i, I just want to just pause long enough to tell you how much I'm grateful and how much I'm thankful for you allowing me to do that. Folks, I don't teach you anything. If, if you're taught at all through any of this, it's through the Word, the Holy Spirit, illumining the truth of His Word to, into, to your life and confirming that. Uh, now, apart from any other confirmation that you might uh, think that occurs outside this book so we're now in the holiest of holies verse 6 and the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles now these are obviously angels acting as priests and they've been called forth and one of the four living creatures, remember we had those in the beginning of the study uh, that surrounded the throne, they're called, they're called beasts. It's, it's a different word, beast, than the word that we had for, for beasts in, in uh, uh, chapter 13. 
One of the four living creatures gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials. Actually, it's the word it's closer to bowls. It's the word means a flat bowl. Full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So now we have the completeness, the fullness of God's wrath. We've, we, we've seen the beginnings of it. We've seen the beginnings of sufferings and difficulties that, that Christ mentioned in Matthew 24. Now we're at the completion of His wrath and these judgments these these of these bowls judgments they happen very very rapidly and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of god you can go back through the scriptures and see when that when god descended on uh, the mount uh, mount sinai uh, uh, when he descended on the tabernacle in the wilderness when he when he descended on the tabernacle that Solomon built, there was a cloud and sometimes there was smoke. I believe smoke is used here because this, this is coupled with the finality of God's judgment upon unrighteousness. The smoke is from the glory and the power of God. That's why the, the temple is filled with it. And no man, no man is able to enter that temple until... All of God's judgments are completed. So the seven plagues of the seven angels are completed. This carries over into the next chapter. So I believe we're looking at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, so if you want to flip over to the next chapter, chapter 16, verse 1, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the bowls. I'm just going to say bowls. Pour out the bowls of the wrath of God upon the earth. Upon the earth. Not, not Mars, not Jupiter. Saturn, uh, not the moon, not the universe, but the earth. You know, there are billions of galaxies, and, and in, in each galaxy, there's, there's billions of, of planets and stars, and the earth is just one little ball. And there's a great lesson there for you and for me. How, how would you compare yourself with God? If we compare the earth with the universe, we're not only insignificant in the magnitude of, in the expanse in comparison to the universe. Compared to the universe, earth is, is nothing. And I've listened to the, 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 the skepticism of those who are, are a whole lot, much more smarter than I am telling me how foolish it is to consider Earth to be so unique. You know, there's, there's, there must be other planets that also have life. And we can go on and on with that discussion. What I see in that is that the Earth is, is as insignificant to the universe as man is insignificant to God. And yet the earth is, as far as we know, in, in any of the investigations that we've been able to make, unique. And it's wonderful to know that it should be for us all, you and me both, should be wonderful for us to realize that we are also unique with God. You know, here's my heavenly Father. You know, I, you know, if I look, if I look at the billions and the billions of stars and planets, you know, what about the the billions and billions of people, folks who've lived over the years, lived down through the centuries? Who am I compared to that multitude? I also am nothing, and yet to God, I'm everything. To God, I'm a jewel, and so are you. And I think it's fabulous to see how much God has given us 
the blessings that we receive, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. A tremendous lesson in the vast gulf that exists between us and God and the, and the vast gulf that exists between this earth and the universe and this earth and heaven. Earth is insignificant in comparison to the whole universe, but we are not insignificant to God. In His sight, we stand before Him without spot. We've been identified with Christ. We stand before Him without spot, without blemish. He's redeemed us, and He is dealing in justice with unrighteousness and sin, and that's what we want. That's what we look for. Reminds me of, of righteous Lot, whose who's soul was tormented day and night. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them that worshipped his image. A noisome and grievous sore. I don't see any reason not to take that literal. There were sores uh, in the plagues on Egypt. Those were literal. I believe these are literal. If these sores are, as some suggest, you know, you re go through the commentaries, you'll hear people, you know, say, you know, these are uh, describing the destruction of Jerusalem, the French Revolution, the the uh, the wars of Napoleon. They go on and on, you know. Well, if that's the case, then we've lived through most of the terrible day of the Lord and His wrath, and we never knew it. I, I just I can't do that. Absolutely makes no sense to me. I believe these are literal sores that fell upon all of those who had received the mark of the beast. And that's just the first bowl. Now, folks, I don't I don't know what a noisome, noisome sore is. I don't know what that is. Take your pick, of, you know, of crying, screaming, coughing, sneezing, you know, uh, I don't know. The text doesn't say. But it says it's very grievous, and it says it's noisome. You know, reading between the lines, I'd, I'd say that noisome means a cry of agony, of despair. I just, I just don't know. I do know that my God only does justice and righteousness. Is this a fair return for those who have despised Christ, blasphemed him, said that he doesn't exist? I think it's just. And the second angel, the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. I believe this, too, to be literal. I've read... I, I've read some that say, well, it's, it's, it, this has got to be the Sea of Galilee, or at the most, it's the Mediterranean Sea. I think it's all the, the waters of the earth, all, sea, all seven seas. I mean, that's my personal opinion. doesn't make it right, but uh, all the sea life dies. That's, that's pretty bad, I suppose, for those who like seafood. The... The Greek says every living soul, it's sukos in, in the Greek, soul. Every living soul died in the sea. Now, wh whether that, that includes uh, sailors and submarines, I don't know. It's surely all the sea life. It appears to me that God is taking famine to the extreme. Here. Uh I think it, it may also, since seas represents seas as symbolic of, of people and nations, and you know, uh, it could have more uh, a more of a deeper meaning there as well. 
we do have verses of Scripture. The Gentile nations are as a troubled sea, but it's hard for me to see the human nations becoming as blood and all dying. So I take it as literal. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I, and I heard the angel of the waters say, isn't that interesting? I heard the angel of the waters say. I, that's a wonderful expression. I don't know what your Bible says. Apparently, I, well, I don't want to read more into that than I should, but I, I come to places like this in my study and I stop, and the angel of the waters. I mean, is there an angel of the highway? Is there is there an angel of the air? Is there an angel of the mountains? Is there a is there a, a an angel of the grass? Uh, you know, if there is, I you know I wish I wish mine would make it grow slower. An angel of the waters. I think it's safe to assume here, you know. Dearly beloved, that, that God is managing. In managing his creation, he's appointed messengers. He's appointed angels that have distinct responsibilities. And, and I believe that as you and I, as, as part of that cr created order, uh, yeah, I do. I believe in guardian angels. Uh, I, think, I think each one of us probably has more than one. I do know that they are ministering. They 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 appear as ministering spirits. They they bring the help bring the truth of God's word into our lives. But I I believe that also involves protection. This this one happens to be of the waters. Now two things come to my mind. All right, one is nothing is going to be destroyed until God says it is. Okay. And two, we aren't just looking at the ungodly here, but the habitation of the godly, which also fell as a result of Adam's sin. All of creation fell. Verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. It seems to me like the text, the very text right here, is telling us why these waters were turned to blood. For they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. This is, note how this is. Uh, God really pushes forward the the fact that He is in the in, in in the midst of what we're looking at, which is the outpouring of the most severe most severe judgments of the wrath of God, the the most horrible, uh, gruesome wrath of God. That God wants us to not for not to escape our notice that His judgments are righteous, that He's just in doing this. Ah, oh, the terrible things that God's people have suffered, and, and still are. But, but you know, uh, you know, you think back, thrown to the lions, burned at the stake. You know, we can't we can't comprehend how terrible some of those were. You know, crucified. There sits the God of glory, while His people, you know, His people, those for whom Christ died, are slaughtered. Of course, He's just, and of course. It's right. It seems to me that, that now we we not only have the sea, but all of the rivers and the streams and springs, the, that's wells, okay? All, all of it turned to blood. If I could sum this all up in one sentence, I think that it would be the salvation of the righteous is as sure as God's judgment on the wicked. Dearly beloved, Please listen to me. If we are not eternally secure in Christ, if He doesn't bottle our tears, if He doesn't lead us along and light our path, if He doesn't hold us in the hollow of His hand, 
if we're not those for whom that he doesn't allow anything to touch our lives except it be for our ultimate good, if, if, if we are not those for whom Christ died, that he loved so much that he gave his only begotten son to die in our place so that we could not ever die, If we are not eternally secure in Christ, as so many professing Christians today, especially around YouTube, you know, foolishly and piously suggest, if we are not eternally secure in Christ, then folks, God cannot be just in executing judgment on the un ungodly, on the on the wicked those who have made the earth their permanent abode. He cannot, he cannot be just in executing judgment on them because all of our judgment fell on Christ. The argument against once saved, always saved is a foolish argument because the entire argument more than often suggests that by my believing in once saved, always saved, well, yeah, I stand in fear of that very judgment which falls upon the ungodly, which is more than blatantly incorrect. It is blasphemously false. It denies, it rejects the very truth concerning what Christ accomplished on behalf of those for whom he died. Okay? Stop this day, this very day. Just please, I ask you all, stop this very day and just pause long enough to think about what it meant for Christ to die in your place. So we see in God's wrath here, we see it's terrible. Terrible to the ungodly. We see that it will have an end. We see that it is consented to by all the company of heaven. It, that it evidences the, the, the just, the justice of God, that God is righteous, that He's just. It evidences the holiness of God. And it's followed by the coming of all nations to worship. All nations to worship before God. Not just Israel, but all nations. It's that world that we look forward to. Or at least it's the world that the... Uh, of course, uh, you know, there's now we get into the subject of, you know, our, uh, our function and purpose uh, during that millennial reign of Christ where, you know, our, uh, our abode is the, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. Our, our blessings, folks, are not earthly, okay? They're spiritual. I care very much about, about all of your, and I pray for you all constantly, that the Lord would meet all of your, your, your needs in abundance particularly, especially, okay, that you would come to realize just how abundantly He's met your, 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 your needs in Christ spiritually. Folks, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Rest in Him. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.